All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started now. My name is Hector Silva, and welcome to Lens with Advanced Design. Today's guest is Carly Ayers. She is a writer using language and interaction to engage people in new, interesting ways. Carly has also, uh, she also works on UX community and culture at Google. I personally um, saw Carly and met her at the Core 77 uh, conference back in 2018 um, in Brooklyn, New York. And that's where I um, was exposed to her firm at the time and um, her work. So thank you, Carly, so much for being a part of Lens. And uh, we're gonna get started. So I'm gonna give the floor over to her and she can kind of jump in and share a little bit about some of her work and her journey. So thank you, Carly, for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, so yeah, so you have the floor and you can go ahead and uh, get started. Oh, let me share my screen. And away we go. Cool. Uh, the obligatory, I hope you can see this comment. I'm gonna assume that you can because this technology hasn't failed me so far, but if you can't, Hector, scream, let me know. Um, as Hector said, I am Carly. Uh, thank you so much to all of you, wherever you're calling in from, for joining me on this, what is here, a beautiful Sunday afternoon in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, this is uh, an emoji scape of a little bit of what my week has looked like. A few highs, a few lows, I think. Uh, it's, I remember when Hector first reached out to speak, I was like, ah, oh, the timing feels really off. It was like back, maybe it was like March, we, we agreed to do this, and then it was June, and the timing just never feels right, I guess, now to do something like this. But uh, I think of the, the community that you've really created here, Hector, and uh, the purpose of these talks feels really important and really meaningful. So uh, I'm really grateful to be able to speak with all of you right now, to be here in Brooklyn and, and to be able to share some things with all of you today. Uh, again, as Hector noted, I'm Carly. Hello. Uh, this is my current website. It's an open editable Google Doc I made back in, oh gosh, I, maybe like 2015. 2016. For most of my career, I've worked as a writer using language and interaction to engage various people in new and interesting ways. And as such, I would say this site is somewhat emblematic of that in that as a Google Doc, it happens to be the place where a lot of my work takes place as a writer. Uh, it's also where I currently work. I work at Google. Uh, although I was using Google Docs long before that, uh, I would like to note. Um, and it's also a space for others to come and engage and participate in that process, which is a theme in a lot of the work that I do. So aside from being a place where people might come and, and leave notes, I might update it with recent projects, but really anyone on the internet can come here and add suggestions or edits. And, and so it's seen quite a few iterations since 2015, earning it the title of one of the 10 ugliest websites on the internet. Thank you very much to Fast Company for that. And right now it looks like this because frankly, no one really needs to be coming and looking at my website right now. Instead, they should be focusing their attention on those who are underrepresented and often undersupported in this industry long before we put little black squares on our feeds and should be looking for different ways to amplify their voices. This is an Instagram post by Yasmin Abdel Majid. If you're not familiar, Yasmin is a Sudanese Australian writer, broadcaster, and award winning social advocate. The caption reads if you can't see it because it's, it's covered by this Photoshop thumb. An example graphic of how to communicate honestly where your organization is at. Hashtag BRB unlearning. And that's where I'm at right now. Uh, a lot of hashtag BRB unlearning. And that BRB unlearning for me right now has felt a little bit like this. Uh, you'll see this beautiful red funnel at the beginning of kind of the wider end of the funnel. 
it says listen, you know, kind of starting by, by just recognizing what space I'm taking up. Can I be listening more? Can I be, as a white woman, amplifying black voices? Uh, the exercise of realizing that silence is violence, so I should be saying something too. Posting that little black square I mentioned earlier, getting a bunch of DMs, being told to take down the black square, take feedback gracefully, learn more, keep showing up, keep doing the work and, and trying to do better. Uh, you'll see outside of this uh, red funnel are things like getting offended or performative wokeness or ignoring people who disagree with you and just feeling bad for yourself and doing nothing at all. Uh, and the idea is kind of moving along uh, this funnel until, until you get to the end, which there really is no end because it's an asymptote, which uh, is a word that I looked up recently and vaguely recalled from some high school calculus class once upon a time. But uh, the whole concept is it's this spinning line. It's not actually a funnel, but it is this uh, spinning line moving through space and time. And, and uh, with each iteration, you're getting closer and closer, but you're never quite getting it. But it is getting a little bit uh, closer to the goal each time. Uh, and this is, yeah, if you were to be able to zoom out, it's learn more and do better and, and make more mistakes and course correct uh, and doing that exercise forever and ever. And so you do. And that to me looks a little bit like this. All that zigging and zagging can feel a bit uncomfortable, um, but that's all just part of growth. It's part of these growing pains. One of the quotes that uh, struck me recently was this, start asking questions about your own relationship with unearned privilege. It's not a negative thing, but it's a true thing. And what else could you be doing with it besides feeling bad for it? Feeling bad about your superpowers help no one. Superman doesn't mope around about his super strength. He uses it to help people. Uh, Baratunde Thurston, comedian and author. And there's a lot of work to be done. For me, that's mostly led to taking a critical look at my own work, spaces I've even created, and looking at how my unchecked biases and racism has played a role in shaping them. And for me, that process of learning and unlearning is one that's ultimately rooted in growth. So it's a principle that's guided a lot of work, a lot of my work over the years and some of the decisions I've made along the way. I think about this idea of the funnel a lot not just for learning or unlearning racism, but for learning other things too. I, I use this template to think about my career trajectory. I think about skills I wanna be learning, ways I wanna be better. Because if you're not learning, then what are you doing? Um, this is a flow chart I've referred to over the years. It's, it's relatively simple in nature as by design. Uh, but I find that it helps me decide whether to keep going or to keep doing something else. Uh, when asked for a title for this talk, I told Hector it would be uh, what to do and you don't know what to do. So a lot of these, these notes and flowcharts are, are techniques and, and tricks I've picked up over the years to help me guide, uh, especially during moments right now where, where the future feels somewhat ambiguous and it's really hard to decide where to place your value. Uh, this flowchart might seem incredibly simple and like a no-brainer, but I do find that just looking and asking myself if I'm learning, yes, no, keep going, do something else, has uh, helped me work my way through a lot of jobs I was on the fence about, or relationships, um, different moments or impasses where I've had to make a decision about that. And it's that guiding principle that led me to start a studio called HARAF, uh, the one that was speaking at the conference mentioned earlier, with three wonderful human beings where our entire goal was to learn. This is one of the first projects we did together called A to Z back in 2016, where the whole goal was to see what it would take to start a small design studio. And everyone at the studio shared that same curiosity and willingness to learn, particularly by doing. With A to Z, we responded to 26 briefs over 26 hours, one hour for every letter of the alphabet. Each hour, uh, we had this word generator, we would click it and it would pick a word for the corresponding letter, uh, and we, then we would make something according to that word. So 
We'd be live streaming it as well. Anyone anywhere could follow along and see what we would make. They'd follow this letter clock that would tell you where in the alphabet we were in our journey. And over those 26 hours, we made a lot of different things. We designed a house, we created a dink bar, which was kind of a kind bar, we made music and even a music video. But what the real goal of all of this was, aside from, yes, launching our, our small scrappy studio and learning how to live stream, which we were interested in as well, was to demystify the inner workings of that studio. We called this work creative accessibility. How could we show the stuff that typically stays behind closed doors? To rewind very quickly, back when I was in school, uh, I had this moment before graduating where I shared my, my beautiful spiral bound industrial design portfolio you see here uh, of my projects, my laser cut bowl, my doodles. Uh, and I shared it with this, this startup founder uh, who I will not name, but uh, this guy, he, he looked at it, he flipped through my book, and he, he immediately was like, what do you do? I don't get it. You have a lot of different things here. I had taken classes in everything from environmental architecture and slip casting to typography. I even took a hologram class. Uh, and then I had taken more classes outside of my department, industrial design, than within it. Uh, I even had to file a petition to graduate because I didn't have... Uh, enough credits within my own department to graduate. And at the end of all of that, I didn't feel any bit closer to knowing what it was that I wanted to spend the rest of my life doing. What types of problems did I want to solve? I called myself a specialized generalist or a generalized specialist. Then I would say generally specializing in, and I would list all the things that I was interested in at the moment. But what I did like doing more than anything else, was talking to my classmates about the things that they were doing. I think my most on-brand story is how I would make these press releases for my classmates, uh, like Jamie Wolfund for his frumpy chairs pictured here, helping them tell the story about their work. I really like this exercise of translating what it was that they were doing and what made that work meaningful and important so that I could share it with others. It was almost this game to me to see how many of my classmates I could get onto various blogs or design sites, figuring out what stories resonated the most. Perhaps very naturally, writing press releases for my friends and classmates led to me starting a blog where I'd write these whole articles too. See, when I joined my department, there wasn't much of an online presence beyond this forum thread on Core 77 that talked about why you should absolutely never hire a RISD industrial design student. So I started a blog where I and a few other enterprising students would interview students, faculty, and alumni about their work, focusing on upping our SEO just enough to be the first result instead of that thread. And it worked. Sure enough, our articles were the first thing you'd find when you'd Google our department, our practice, uh, far beyond even the school site, which led to me writing for the same site with the pesky forum post, uh, and when I moved to New York after graduating, I continued to do that there. And it's something I'm still doing now uh, as part of the UX community and culture team at Google, helping designers, researchers, writers, and engineers share their work and practice on this site called Google Design. And while that process can look from the outside a little bit like this, knowing what I want to do, doing it, in reality, it looked a bit more like this, which I think most people will admit and tell you is true, but is absolutely 100% true. Which brings me back to the funnel. These red lines are the boundaries between what I wanna be doing and what people will pay me to do. Uh, so constantly ricocheting between one line and the other until I can get closer and closer to, to where those two spaces will hopefully eventually intersect. They never quite do. And what do you do when you don't know what to do? How do you set the boundaries of this funnel? your asymptote. Um, I teach this class along with my partner, Sebastian Spire, called Methods and Practices. This class connects the dots between the skills and lessons gleaned as part of uh, a traditional design curriculum with those you need to interface with, you know, the rest of the real world. The end result of which is a set of deliverables that you can then put into action as the foundation of your own practice. 
And in our class, defining your practice starts with defining your values. And in a world where caring about something genuinely and sincerely, and then articulating that, this can be an increasingly vulnerable act and it can be really, really hard. But it's that underlying belief system that will guide your goals, your ambitions, the work you want to do more or less of. It serves as this litmus test for evaluating future work and opportunities. There's no wrong answer here. They are your values after all. And for me, it's an annual exercise that began back when we started that studio. Together, we made a list of those things, values and rules for what we wanted to test out. Like number one says concept. Concept is number one. Always start with a good concept. Or never do something just because that's the way it's been done before. To listen and always tell the truth, always be learning. And every year we would reevaluate that list and make changes to make sure we were growing and evolving in all the ways that we wanted to. This was a more finite, condensed list a few years in. And now, a little over a year after the closing of the studio, I've started to reevaluate what that list looks like for me. What are the tenets of my own practice? How do I approach my work? What do I want the output of that work to be? Those tenets, principles, and values, those become the boundaries of this funnel for me. Similarly, the things outside of the boundaries are where I quickly spiral into feeling unappreciated, undercompensated, compromised. I feel angry, I'm sad, and generally out of sync with the universe. But where do I start with all that? Uh, again, back to our class, it's, it's with defining these values. Uh, I'll take you all through the exercise itself. You can do it on your own time if you find it useful to you. Uh, and then a few examples of where it comes into action in my own practice. So starting out, um, I recall the times in your life when you were at your happiest. What led to those feelings? What were you doing? Were you with others? Recall times in your life where you were most proud. What was happening? What led you to feel that way? What about when you were most fulfilled? Uh, what desire was being met and why did you feel this way? And from that, I have our students create a list of 10 words. 10 words that come up time and time again. Uh, I, can, I went a little overboard the first time I did this exercise and my methodology was I wrote out paragraphs for each of those anecdotes to answer each of those questions. And I put each of them into word cloud generators, which I had forgotten all about in my design practice and were pretty great tools for kind of surfacing up the words and the phrases and the things I kept saying over and over and over again. Uh, you can also do this with a friend, saying it to a friend and having them repeat back to you kind of what stood out to them. But at the end, you wanna come up with this list of 10 words turning each into an actionable tenant. Uh, with our students, we also have them look online. There are so many lists of where they can find different words, pull themes and uh, other values from existing generators or existing word lists, and then use those to make an actionable set of tenants. So ideally things that you can say, you can look to and can help guide your path forward, help you make decisions and put them into your own practice. And we ask them to ask themselves, what do those values say about you? How will that influence the work that you will do? The work that you're simply not willing to do? For me, one of my first tenets is everything is relationships. So in action, let's say back in March when, when COVID first hit the United States, and a lot of jobs are transitioning to remote. Uh, people were being sent home. For me, that was a time where I, I really didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I knew that I was grateful to have a job. I knew I could wear a mask, wash my hands. Some of the things were, were readily apparent to me. But beyond that, I, I didn't really know what my, my work outside of our work looked like. How should I be spending my time? Where should I be placing my value? Uh, and knowing that relationships are something that's really important to me, uh, as well as I was teaching still at Parsons, I was trying to think of a way to extend that to the new digital context. A lot of my students were finding themselves with job offers rescinded or even canceled. 
Uh, and so I told them to do what I do. I was like, go meet people, go get coffee with people. And, and all of them were like, Carly, honestly, everything's canceled. Like, where are we supposed to go? Where are we supposed to go and do this? How are we supposed to meet people? Uh, so I turned to Twitter, which is uh, where I got a lot of my start in design back 2009 when I joined and met a lot of uh, designers that way. And when I first moved to New York, a lot of my relationships came from that. Uh, and I started a thread on Twitter just saying, who's willing to get a digital coffee with a student off the internet? Uh, and hundreds of people have responded to this. Students have chimed in and, and found people to get coffee with through that thread. Uh, and I began just getting digital coffees. I began just meeting with people every single day uh, since March. So just a calendar full. I used Calendly to just let people very easily schedule time. And every morning I would start by having a, a digital coffee with someone off the internet. This was a, a more recent one. Uh, and last month I hit 100 digital coffees, which is kind of wild and quite frankly, way too many digital coffees. But it was good. It was really, really good. I think it was probably one of the best things I've done for, my, it, done for myself during this time. Uh, it was really good for me as an extrovert to, to get that social interaction every day, sparing my boyfriend from having to be my sole source of human connection. Uh, and I met a lot of really interesting people. I've met people that I've uh, joined book clubs with and gotten different recommendations for other ways to be spending my time. I've been connected to other people and connected some of those individuals to jobs and other opportunities I've heard of. And uh, it's really enriched my, my day to day during this time. Another one, uh, share what you know. For me, uh, it's a lot about finding your people, bringing them together. After leaving a full-time job, I began freelancing for just a ton of different folks. Uh, I went through a whole process of freaking out about not getting enough work. I think this was back maybe like 2015. It was a little before the studio. Uh, and then I would take on way too much work. I was working all the time. I was eating poorly, not showering nearly as much as I should. Uh, I would get really sick. I would try to keep working through that and just really doing things in an isolated way. Eventually, I did end up landing this longer term freelance gig that helped me get to a routine, but the entire experience made me realize that I couldn't do this alone. I longed for a place where I could go, I could talk to other people, I could ask questions, stay social, and ultimately keep me connected to reality. Now, nose deep into freelancing, I really wanted to talk to people who had come before me uh, and see if we couldn't help each other along the way. Thus, Hundreds Under 100, or Hundreds, or Hundos was born. It was this play on this Forbes 30 Under 30 list and other awards given to a certain group of people under a specific age. Hundreds was meant to be the antithesis. Inclusive and inviting, everyone was welcome. It ended up being this community space for freelancers and other creative folks to share work, give advice, providing an alternative to say, tweeting how much I should charge a potential client who is likely already following me on Twitter. I started it as a Slack group because that was the cool new enterprise software of the time. Uh, and there were just a few channels very early on, intros, help, jobs. Shortly after, brought on a group of admins and together we made a code of conduct, worked for a few other communities and it's seen a lot of iterations since then. We have this show and tell series now, which is open to everyone and is an opportunity for people across a range of disciplines to come together, share their work in an informal setting, usually in six minutes or less. And it's a lot of fun. They also help break away from the avatars, give everyone a face-to-face -face action, which is something that I miss a little bit right now. And as part of re-examining uh, a lot of my work in practice, I've been looking a lot at this 100 space. How can we exclude to include or make it a more welcoming, welcoming space for new voices? I don't have a lot of the answers to that right now, but uh, this space and a lot of the value that's come out of it has come from doing that work and questioning my belief system and, and seeing what I could be doing better. And that's a lot of the work that I've been doing lately. 
Another example of one of my tenants in action is share what you know. With the studio, we would share what we knew by opening ourselves up via questions, via Instagram or email, which inspired a series called HRF Live, where we'd invite folks to come and ask us questions in person. Not only did it help combine 10 coffees into one, but the best insights usually came from the people who attended, frequently answering each other's questions, connecting each other to opportunities, and bringing a host of diverse perspectives and experiences. So the conversations were that much better. We also shared what we knew by showing our profit and loss statement at industry conferences, like at that Core 77 conference uh, for other studio founders. And we wrote about our intake process for the Creative Independent. If you've ever dreamed of having clients or you have clients and you're just looking to pick up a few new tips or see how someone else does it, this whole guide exists on the Creative Independent and has everything from uh, how to send an initial email to knowing when you should walk away, how to calculate your rate, your prices. Uh, super easy to plug and play. We also shared this flowchart of our decision-making process for what types of projects we should take on, including a section where we ask ourselves, are we broke? Yes, no, if so, are we like really, really broke? And are we gonna feel okay and be willing to talk about this? And if the answer is no, we don't do it. It's that simple. We believe that we, if we couldn't afford to take on work uh, that we didn't believe in, then we probably shouldn't be running the studio. And as part of the announcement that we were shutting down the studio, we also shared a link to a Google Drive folder with various templates, tools, and other things we've created over the course of running Hara. In starting the studio, we were really interested in learning how to run the studio. So in shutting it down, we wanted to share all of that in hopes that it might be helpful to someone else. And I think what's really interesting about some of these projects for me is these were not the client projects. These were, we made lots of really cool websites and interactive experiences and, and things that I was definitely proud of and was our core work. But when I look back over the years and the work that I was very excited about, it is this work that was more tied to those values and, and to the boundaries of that funnel that I want to do more of and figure out how to work that into my schedule. When you invite people into your process, they get invested in it they care a lot more about the end result. Uh, when we shut down the studio, uh, we heard a lot. I got a lot of emails from people who had followed us, people wrote Medium articles, uh, and it made me realize that in sharing a lot of that work, uh, people did tend to get invested in it and they cared a lot about it. Even if that end result is shutting down your studio. Your values are going to change over time as well. Those boundaries of that funnel, they will shift and they will move. And, and through reevaluating them, you're able to make sure that you're growing and evolving in all the ways that you want to. I'm a big believer in leveraging the things you can do to do the things that you want to do. And through that, you kind of ricochet between those two boundaries over and over and over again until you start to move in the direction that you're excited about, you find the things that you want to be doing more of. You may never find the perfect balance. I don't know that those two lines, I certainly haven't ever found the perfect intersection of getting paid to do the things I want to do or work-life balance or uh, any of those two um, boundaries of my funnel, but the only way to move forward is by getting that experience and, and finding what it is that I want to be doing more of, what feels right, what doesn't, and trying to move in that direction. To learn and unlearn and to continue checking in with myself to make sure that I'm, you know, making the things that I want to be making. Thank you. That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a couple of questions to ask you and we'll start taking questions from our audience. But um, I think when I saw your presentation at the Course 97 conference, I think one thing that um, was really appealing to me was how open and transparent you are with sharing this information. I am um, being in the field that we're in, design which is very competitive and everyone 
you know, wants to up each other, you know, oh, I know this, I know how to do this, I'm not going to share it. You're like complete opposite. And I love that. I mean, someone who really advocates for education, I, I, I would love to hear more about, about, about your kind of thought process behind that. Yeah, I mean, with the studio, such a big piece of it was, you know, we had all worked at all these different places. We had worked at small studios, big studios, startups, agencies, um, all these different places. And yet we still felt like we lacked the knowledge of what it took to run a studio. Like through all these experiences, you know, you're always told like, take the, you have to do the internship or you have to pay your dues, or you have to do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll know. But I think through doing a lot of these jobs, I just found that there was this, this ceiling of what I could learn and what people were willing to share and what people were willing to tell you. My boss was never going to tell me, unfortunately, uh, some bosses do and it's very cool, but they weren't going to tell me how much they were getting paid to do the work that I was doing. Uh, and I think we just, the Andrew, Nikki, Pedro and I, we met working together at Google and the creative lab there. And we had all had these experiences and we knew that we wanted to know what it was like to run a studio. We wanted to know why are things the way that they are? Why, uh, you know, you, you get these feelings, you get like really frustrated sometimes, or I mean, maybe I'm, that was my experience. I'd like have get a project or something. I'd be like, why are we doing it this way? And why can't I just talk to the person on the other side? And are you really sure that's the right direction? You just kind of have this feeling that maybe things would be a little bit better if, you did it yourself. Uh, and that was definitely a feeling that all of us maybe had in some capacity. And, and when starting the studio, we wanted to find out for ourselves. And with that, we wanted to put a lot of that information out there. So other people hopefully could learn from it, hopefully wouldn't repeat our own mistakes uh, and create an archive in that way where at least it's a foundation for someone else to start from here next time instead of down here. Uh, but your mileage may vary. I think uh, for anyone who has gone through those archives, they've, I've gotten a lot of emails where people are like, oh, like this piece was really helpful or this piece was really helpful. I've gotten other emails where people are like, why did you do things this way? Like you should have been doing things that way. So I think it, it resonates with people differently depending on where they are in their path and, and what type of work that they're doing. Yeah, that's amazing. And um, even when you were running your studio in your presentation, you showed some very uncomfortable questions that I think some people are not ready to ask um, when you go into business with, with someone, you know, like the question that really stood out to me is, are we broke? Right. I think that's something that especially finances, we try to hide um, or we try not to talk about because it's, there's, it's, there's a stigma behind it. Um, is that something that you had to learn um, as you started your studio with other people just kind of being a little uncomfortable with some of these conversations? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's definitely not something that came naturally. I think everyone, of course, has different relationships to these topics, depending how you were raised or, or what you've had access to. I think talking about money is one for me that I, I am always going to be kind of uncomfortable about, but it was something that we knew we had to be able to talk about. We knew that we had to have this foundation of trust. We knew that, I mean, it's like starting a business with someone, you'll, everyone says this, but it's like getting married. You know, it's a, you're literally entering this kind of legal financial relationship with someone where to get it dissolved, you have to get paperwork done. You have to have lawyers sign it. Like there is work that, that needs to be done to start it and to end it. And when you enter a commitment like that, I think you have to be able to have those conversations. And uh, I think we saw it a lot as if we couldn't talk about that stuff at the beginning, then we weren't ready to, to enter a relationship like that together because you have to be able to have those hard conversations. That's I think externally is like a whole different thing, you know, like is, do you need to do that? Like probably not, but uh, it's a good exercise. And I mean, when you had the studio, was the goal because having a studio i think is every designer's dream because you work for yourself you kind of are in control um of a lot of things um when you started Hallraf, was that something that was like this is it i'm gonna do this for the rest of my life absolutely 100 percent. i i really i mean i thought maybe not forever but i thought it was gonna be i thought we were gonna do that for like 20 years or something. Yep. i was like 
this is it. We are in it. And like, what, what we made it, we made it like three and a half years, I think, um, which is a bummer in some ways, but in other ways, there was kind of this moment after we made the decision to shut down, which I will briefly expand on for, for those who might not be familiar with the eons of articles that uh, we've written about it and all the other stuff that's out there on the web. But um, yeah, I mean, we kind of just reached a point where we realized we all wanted different things. And it's, it's really kind of boring and to uh, how those things go, but it's true, you know, especially if you're being good about it and you're checking in on yourself and you're asking, am I growing in the ways that I want to, that all of a sudden maybe, maybe those stars aren't totally aligned. And, I think when I look back at the beginning, like we did start the studio to learn. Uh, so when those conversations came up and, and someone was like, I've learned what I wanted to learn. Now I want to go start my own studio. I was like, oh, oh I can't believe it. I thought, uh, I mean, we said that, but like, I thought we were doing this forever. Yeah. Um, but I do think we all learned a lot through the experience, which was the goal of starting the studio. So um, it, it did work out in, in that way. but. And then there was something like after it did end where, and every, all the paperwork was done, which was only gosh, the beginning of this year, because it takes a while to untangle those things. Um, where I was like, oh, now this is a thing that I've done. This is no longer a thing that I am currently doing. And, and that is a very liberating feeling. Uh, in a lot of ways. You did mention that you studied at RISD, right? For undergrad, you went there for industrial design. Um, and uh, I actually didn't know that. And uh, that's actually really quite amazing because I would love to hear a little bit about um, that journey because I feel like there's a lot of industrial designers or a lot of industrial design students that are super hardcore and very committed to, you know, how I'm going to be an industrial designer. And, um, you know, their tunnel vision is really, really, you know, really small. And then they go on to industry and things change. And I would love to hear a little bit on, on how did that happen to you um, as someone that started in a very traditional academic career path and then now you're doing something totally different? Yeah, for sure. I mean, for me, I loved industrial design. When I first discovered it in, when I was in high school, it was like I was applying to schools when I even learned that it as a field existed. Um, I was like, oh, I'm really good at math and I like art. So maybe these are like kind of the same thing together. Maybe this is, you get to like measure a table, but also design it, which uh, as soon as I was in the department, I realized I was sorely mistaken. That is not totally how that works. Um, <laughs> But there's there's a mix. I mean, there's maybe some light engineering depending on on the at, at least at RISD. I think other programs maybe like Carnegie Mellon and are a little bit more engineering driven. But uh, yeah, once I was in the department, I I really I mean I, I still loved objects. I mean I started the blog where I was writing about design and what my classmates were doing. But I realized that was the stuff I was really better at. You know, I, I really like talking to people. I liked the beginning part of the research phase. I liked interviewing people at the Providence Place Mall and asking them how they use a toothbrush. I liked, I liked those aspects. And then when we come to crit, my work was fine. Um, but I was like, this is probably not the thing I want to be doing long term. The real breaking moment was when I had secured an internship at uh, or I was interviewing, or I was pretty close to the, the offer stage of like an internship, which is wild that there's offer stages for internships with uh, Procter and Gamble. And I remember they needed a hair sample. Mm. And I remember just this moment of being like, this cannot be the right choice. Like this is, uh, I, I don't know, works like, I'm gonna go to Ohio and I'm gonna have this hair sample and then I'm gonna be drug tested. and. I was like, this, I don't know. I don't know if this is the right move for me. Extra series, uh, so does called Creative Mornings. Um, she's Swiss Miss on the internet, had a design blog. And I was like, do you need anyone to work for you? And she said that she actually just decided she wanted an intern that summer. And she decided it was fate that I had emailed her on that day and hired me on the spot. 
So I ended up going to New York instead and working at Creative Mornings. Uh, and that kind of led to everything else. I think as far as moving away from physical product design, it was a lot of the writing stuff. It was writing the design blog, working for Tina who had her design blog, uh, and just being able to kind of get experience in, in other corners and then leverage that stuff to, to do the stuff that I want to be doing more of now. Um, I'm interviewing actually at Google for the role that I'm in now. It, it did just kind of, it blew my mind to know that yeah, I have no traditional training in the work that I'm doing right now. It is purely just leveraging experience and all those relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I did not go to school for writing. I did not. <clears throat> uh, I've taken like work weekend workshops and classes here and there, but it really has just been about like creating projects for myself that have allowed me to do this work. But isn't that more exciting? I feel like... Well, I feel like that's a hundred times more exciting than having your career path be so linear. It is, but I do envy that, you know, like the whole, like having a, the startup founder shit on my portfolio was such a bummer. Like I just remember like in those moments where I didn't have, and I mean, I didn't, well, I think, yeah, I didn't have the confidence that I have now that I was headed in the right direction. And it was really hard for me to figure out what that direction should be. I knew that it wasn't that direction, it wasn't that direction, and so then I would go in that direction. I'd go there for like seven paces, and then I'd be like, eh, I should probably be heading over here. And it, I really did feel like a, just ricocheting through this, this funnel a lot of the times. And at least once I realized it was a funnel and I was, set, I was able to set the boundaries, then I knew I was at least moving in some direction. But I think when you really, when you're in this zone, you really feel kind of lost. Uh, I get a lot of questions too about just like how do you define yourself uh, when you're in those spaces too because I think so many people are able to just say I'm an industrial designer or I'm a graphic designer uh, and I've never been able to do that I've always had to define myself by kind of the, the space that I exist in or the type of work that I do but I've never really felt attached to any specific title or anything along those lines. Fantastic. Um, yeah, and I do want to apologize that my internet is unstable. Um, but thank you so much for powering through these questions. Um, but now you work for Google. And I want to ask you, are you excited and happy with what you're doing at Google? It's a good question. Sometimes. Sometimes I am. I don't think... Um, I don't think it's my forever home per se. I think I, I run into the same things I ran into the last time I worked at Google. Uh, I get, I mean, for me working in the creative lab the first time around, that was my dream job when I was in school. That was like, I thought that was the coolest thing. Uh, and the thing about dream jobs is as soon as you get them, you, you, it's not a dream anymore. It's just a job. It's just kind of this thing that you're doing. And I like a lot of the work I liked a lot of the work I did then. I think the problems that I'm solving right now are really interesting. Uh, I like writing and working with different designers and writers and researchers to help them talk about the things that they do. But I definitely still have like a few little itches that I want to scratch. Um, I don't know that it'll be anytime soon, but I definitely see myself going back and starting a studio and kind of investing back in. Uh, actually this space, we just, uh, my boyfriend and I moved into this studio space last weekend uh, and I already I feel like excited about working on a, a personal practice and a few projects that I've been putting off for a while but to be totally honest like since March I feel like I've just been so tired uh, and not incredibly inspired to do a lot of different things but um, I am grateful to have a job and I do think there was something about uh, uh, especially from the place that I was when I, when I gave that talk when I met you mm -hmm. just thinking about where my next client is coming from. I'm not thinking about like a million things all the time. And it's nice to take a break from that, but uh, I do miss it. Just a teensy bit. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh, entrepreneur spirit and that uh, autonomy that sometimes you don't get from corporate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to bring up uh, the very first stuff or the very first uh, part of your presentation where you talked about, um, you know, the 
injustices that are happening in our country yeah. and how you were able to um, pause and learn. Um, and thank you for sharing that. And uh, I think designers, I think we live in a bubble and I feel, I feel like sometimes things that happen in real life, we feel like, you know, we're protected by this bubble and it's never going to interfere with what we do. Um, and sometimes, you know, people are like, people ask, well, is, is design political? And, and I think maybe like when I was in school, you know, for me, it was like, no, of course not. Like I'm, I'm, I live in this bubble. Like I don't ever have to deal with politics. And then I went into industry and you're like, holy shit, it's all business. And a lot of it is like 99% is business and 1% is actually design. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that and, and how you adjusted and adapted to everything that's going on um, as a designer who lives in New York. Um, and you were facing multiple things, you know, with not only, you know, activism, but also New York got hit the hardest in the beginning of COVID and how that all kind of, how you dealt with that as a designer and as an individual. Totally. Yeah, I think I'm like, when I think of my journey from just like discovering design to discovering what I could do, like I was definitely, when I first discovered design, just, I was so enamored with it and I was totally uh, on this design can save the world uh, soapbox. I would do projects about how design could save the world. I would, every problem I was like, could be solved with post-it notes and just a, a few few good designers in a room. Uh, and then I graduated and the cynicism, especially living in New York, just really sunk in. And, and I think I've been, uh, I've been living in that cynicism and I still carry a lot of it. Of just like, what can design do? Like design can do, I went through, yeah, design can destroy the world. If you look at uh, uh, mounds of garbage or how gerrymandering works or so many of the problems we see in society have been designed to work that way. I think uh, Mike Montero, who uh, I go back and forth on, he, he wrote this wonderful book, Ruined by Design, which I think is a good entry point if you're not familiar with it. If you are more familiar with that as like a concept, uh, Kenneth Bowles wrote this really wonderful book on design and ethics that, that I enjoyed reading this year. But uh, I think through, through both of those, I'm just like, oh wow, like design, uh, can be hugely impactful in a very negative way. Uh, and now I'm coming out on the other side of like, okay, design can be good, design can be bad. It's probably not gonna save the world, but I do think that as designers, as people who make things, we have a huge responsibility to do right by that and to understand what the impact of our actions are. Um, being in New York, working in a large technology company uh, definitely carries a few, few notes with it. I think in the early days, it was, yeah, trying to figure out how to uh, shut up and listen and see where I was needed. Uh, I think for the most part, that was donating money. I was like, donate money, show up to protest, like be a body, be, uh, put money like where my mouth is and like invest in these initiatives that need support right now. Uh, as time went on, it was also um, my students, my students trying to find jobs. I really felt like that was like where my energy was needed. Uh, and now it's trying to figure out just like how to sustain this more long term. Like, is like what is the change that I can make realistically in my workplace? What is the change I can make realistically in my community? Uh, my boyfriend and I have gotten like more involved with our uh, local mutual aid group, uh, working on community fridges and delivering meals, and like finding these things that we can do that we can build into our schedule and make part of our routine rather than just kind of like blunt force like putting a bunch of energy into one place and then uh leaving that space which sometimes can be more damaging than doing anything at all so uh that's a lot of different things but that's kind of been where my head's been at now i think yeah especially with like hundos that community i run thinking about yeah i've created this space what has my impact here been for better or for worse and like what are the things i can do to set it up to be better in the future and Sometimes I think those initiatives, just those small, sowing those smaller seeds can, can uh, yeah, that, that can be where the work happens and how you move forward. Right. Well, 
Carly, thank you so much for being part of Lens and for coming on and being very honest and transparent about the work that you do. Um, we really appreciate it. And it's really awesome um, that you're also an educator. I, that is amazing. I think being an educator um, is uh, kind of, you know, with the how excited you are about your work and how much you want to give back, I think that's the perfect kind of career path for you. So uh, that, that's very amazing. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, this session has been recorded. We'll make it available uh, very soon. And then we'll link your social media platforms to our video. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Sunday. And Carly, I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Yeah, oh, it was nice to, to chat again. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Take care, everyone.